questions from online. And with that, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Prime Minister Imran Khan. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy. Uh, the United States uh, Institute of Peace. Yeah, listening to my view uh, about Pakistan, Pakistan's, pol Pakistan's policy. Um, and I start with uh, how someone like me, a sportsman, for 20 years, international sportsman who ended up in politics. Um, I'm the first generation Pakistani. My parents were born in colonial India. I was the first generation who grew up in an independent Pakistan. We grew up with a lot of pride. My parents reminded me always how awful it was to live uh, in a colonial, in a in a country where you were not, you didn't have your freedom. So I valued the freedom uh, of being uh, in an independent country. And we took great pride when Pakistan started growing rapidly in the 60s. It's not used to my voice, I think it's too heavy. For me. In, the, in the 60s, Pakistan was the fastest growing country in the whole region. Uh, Pakistan was a country which gave us hope. We, we grew up feeling that this is a country with a destiny. And then things started going wrong from 70s onwards. And, um, uh, and I was playing cricket for, for two decades, international sports, when I finished in the early 90s. And my initial thought after playing sport was to um, go into social work. I had already uh, started building a cancer hospital. My mother had died of cancer, and I realized that there was no cancer hospital in Pakistan, so I thought I would build one, uh, specifically because poor people cannot afford cancer treatment. So I spent six, seven years of my life uh, after cricket building and then running the hospital. Uh, but it was during that time I realized that uh, this is a big country, Social work was not going to change it. The only way we would change our country is uh, joining politics. Change only comes through uh, when you head a government and bring about a change. Uh, and the reason why I, I joined politics was because I realized our politics was going uh, in a direction which was uh, leading Pakistan to nowhere. Problem with uh, most ex-colonial countries is, was exactly what, was, what, what Pakistan was facing. If you look at Africa, you look at uh, the independence movements in Africa, and then the, uh, uh, the leaders who came from the independence movement once they assumed government, a similar pattern took place. The moment they got power, they used power for uh, benefiting themselves. Corruption was the main reason why countries could not reach their potential. And Pakistan was exactly that country which in the 60s, while was going, taking off, from mid-80s onwards, it started going down because of corruption. Corruption of the ruling elite. So my main, when I formed my party in 1996, it was on an anti-corruption platform. And I campaigned for 15 years in the political wilderness talking about corruption and could not make people understand the relevance, uh, the, the relation between corruption and poverty. People could not relate the two. Somehow in, in ex-colonial countries, people thought uh, taking money from the government was nothing wrong with it because it was, an, it was not your, your government. It was a foreign government which was ruling over you. So if you evaded taxes, there was, you know, you were, you were not doing anything wrong, and similarly corruption. So uh, I formed my party, as I said, in 1996. Uh, for 15 years, 
I had only a few people with me, uh, and no one thought I had a chance. But then suddenly, people began to understand what I was saying. So the party then began to take off uh, about seven years ago. And in 2013, we formed uh, government in one of the four provinces. And uh, because of our performance in that one performance, uh, in, in that one province, uh, in 2018, we won the elections. So what have I, what has been the main challenge since we've uh, come to power 10 months ago? Number one challenge was inheriting, inheriting a country which was bankrupt. We had the, the biggest current account and fiscal deficits. But worse, what corruption does is it, it's not just a question of bankrupting a country and and money being laundered out of the country. What happens is the ruling elites, they, when they uh, make money, when they make uh, money out of corruption, they then have to take it out of the country because otherwise people would know, would ask them questions, where did the money come from? So you suffer tw in two ways. Number one, the money which should go to human development ends up going into people's pockets, but secondly, that, that money leaves the country. And in my opinion, which I spoke to President Trump yesterday, the biggest problem that the world faces is about a trillion dollars leaving developing and poor countries and either go, going into offshore accounts or they end up in uh, Western countries. And this is impoverishing, this is causing more deaths than through terrorism, than through drugs. The amount of people dying of hunger and disease, uh, lack of education, not cle having clean drinking water, is because of the ruling elites in developing world taking that money out and uh, parking it into, uh, as I said, offshore accounts or uh, Western countries. So we've, we've, we faced a similar situation. We had, uh, uh, the, the biggest current account deficit and fiscal deficit. But the other aspect of corruption is that in order for the ruling elites to take money out, they have to destroy the state institutions. Because if the institutions are strong, they would not be able to take the money out. For instance, if your anti-corruption body is strong, if your justice system is, is working, is robust, if your uh, taxation department, like equivalent to the Indian Revenue here or the um, IRS here, if these institutions are strong, you cannot take money out of the country. But, but uh, that's the biggest damage these corrupt ruling elites do to uh, uh, developing world. They destroy these institutions. So, you know, you can recover the money but what you can't, to build institutions take, takes time. So what we are, the biggest challenge we have faced since we've been in power is trying to build the state institutions. And, uh, uh, you know, we have, we have succeeded. We have turned around uh, various institutions, but it is a slow process. Uh, the relationship uh, which we had with our neighbors, uh, of, uh, the other priority we have tried to uh, instill in Pakistan amongst the people is that we must have good relationship with all our neighbors. Because Pakistan at the moment, most of all, needs stability. We need stability to, for economic progress. We need peace. And so for peace, we need ha to have a, 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 a good relationship with our neighbors. So, First was me trying to reach out to India. India is, um, you know, uh, a country which we've had turbulent relationship with. But unfortunately, um, uh, because of one issue of Kashmir, uh, whenever we have tried, whenever relationship has got started to move in the right direction with India, some incident happens. Uh, and, and that's all related to Kashmir, we go back to square one. And so we, I, I reached out to uh, my counterpart in India, the Indian Prime Minister, uh, assured him that, you know, we, you, you come one step towards us, we will go to 
steps towards you because the biggest problem India and Pakistan face is poverty. And the best way we can reduce poverty is if we start trading with each other. Um, the next was Afghanistan. We again have had a difficult relationship with Afghanistan. <clears throat> uh, uh, and so uh, we have reached out. I have uh, invited President Ghani to Pakistan. And, you know, I've, it's a sort of long story, but we are moving towards, fortunately, we are all moving towards the same direction. There's a convergence now in Pakistan, in the US, that there is no military solution in Afghanistan. So we are all working towards uh, the peace process. Uh, similarly with Iran, we've had sort of uh, uh, a decent relationship with Iran without, you know, it's not really a warm relationship, but a decent relationship with them. So we reached out to all our neighbors. Uh, and the next is the US. The US is a superpower. You have to have good relationship with the US, whether you like it or not. So, uh, so I was a bit worried uh, when I was invited to uh, meet President Trump. Uh, do you know, I have never, I've been in limelight public life for 40 years. And so when I've gone to meet people who are famous or well-known or in power, you, you normally get advice that, you know, how, how you, what you should do, what questions you should ask when you meet them. But never in my life have I had so many suggestions when I, before I was going to meet President Trump. <laughs> Inundated. And I have to say that it was one of the most pleasant surprises, not just for me, for my delegation. Uh, the way, the hospitality, the way he strayed forward, charming way he treated us, so we were all blown over. We loved the meeting with the, the president yesterday. But above all, we, we decided on how we will now have a close relationship uh, between Pakistan and the U.S., how we will now ensure that there is no communication gap. Uh, the, the period from 2003 or 4 to, to uh, 2015 was the worst in the relationship between Pakistan and the U.S. Pakistanis felt that they were fighting the U.S. war. It was, uh, no Pakistani was involved in 9-11. Uh, Taliban were in Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda was in Afghanistan. But Pakistan ended up involved in that war. And we lost 70,000 people. We lost over $100 billion uh, lost to our economy. And yet, there was mistrust. Pakistan felt it was doing its best. It, it could have stayed out of the war. And yet, Pakistan participated in the war, and Pakistan took a battering. There was a point when people like us thought, are we going to survive? Because there were suicide bombs going on every day. The, there were uh, no sports team used to visit Pakistan, forget about investors. And so we passed through a terrible period, but at the same time, the U.S. thought we weren't doing enough. We were playing a double game. So that was, in my opinion, the worst, uh, it was the worst uh, 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 phase between the U uh, relationship of, between U.S. and Pakistan. Uh, I was one of those, and I, I came here, I think in 2009, and I tried to explain to people here that there was no military solution in Afghanistan. I met, uh, then Democrats hadn't come into power, the elections hadn't happened just before uh, President Obama won the elections. Uh, I tried to explain to, I had a meeting organized, there's Dr. Ikram here, he organized a meeting with uh, Joe Biden, uh, John Kerry, Harry Reid, uh, towering figures of the Democratic Party. And I sat there and tried to explain to them the history of Afghanistan, of Pakistan's tribal area, and tried to explain to them that this, the, there will be no military solution. But I realized they had no idea. People in the U.S. had no idea about the, about the uh, history of Afghanistan and the sort of conflict they had got involved in. Uh, and fortunately, this time, everyone knows, people understand. So. Uh, why do I think that we will now have uh, 
the very best of relationship with the US because we, we are all on the same page. Previous, previously, Pakistan uh, army was, was, was supposedly fighting for the US, this, this war on terror, but the US did, did not think we were doing enough. And, and in Pakistan, we thought we had gone out of our way. This time, the Pakistan state, our security forces, the United States, all of us are on the same page. That, the, that peace in Afghanistan will now, can only take place through a political settlement, through dialogue. So we are all now working uh, on, on getting the Taliban to talk to the Afghan government. They've already, they're already talking to the US. And we hope that this will eventually lead to a settlement. Not easy. It's not going to be easy because there's no centralized Taliban command. It's a devolved movement. But we feel that if we all work together, we feel this is the best chance of there to be peace in Afghanistan. Uh, apart from that, uh, domestically, just one final word before I take your questions. Uh, I ha I've struggled these 23 years to, to, uh, to get into power. Uh, most of the, as I said, in wilderness, political wilderness. Uh, I was not fighting political parties. I felt I was fighting a mafia. And the Supreme Court of Pakistan, actually, when there was this famous court case where the prime minister was dismissed, actually called the ruling party a Sicilian mafia. Uh, and I say a mafia because this is not normal politics. Because the, the, the two ruling families had been in power off and on for 30 years. And when you're in power for 30 years, they, their penetration was right down in the bureaucracy, in the judiciary, in the election commission. They had enormous amounts of money. And so we won because we mobilized the people. We mobilized the youth of Pakistan. Uh, we were very fortunate that uh, Pakistan has a 60% uh, of Pakistanis are below the age of 30. They became our big support. The young people rallied around us. And we did, it was a, the biggest pub, public movement in Pakistan in the last 50 years. And, and so we won despite having, uh, coming up against big money, despite the penetration in media, what, the, the most vilification campaign, uh, personal attacks, uh, and despite that we won because of social media. This is the new, it, had there been no social media, probably we would not have been able to beat the established parties. And since we have been in power, we are still up against the mafia. Uh, we have been, uh, the problem has been to fix the economy. But at the same time, we have had the entire opposition trying to destabilize uh, the country. So that twice they have tried to uh, create this uncertainty that there's been a run on the rupee. We almost had a run on the rupee because of them predicting that the all fake news that IMF had told us that the rupee would go to a, a certain number, all wrong, but putting pressure on the economy all the time. Finally, I, I can say right now, after 10 months, we have finally stabilized the economy. And we feel now that we are now, after stabilizing the economy, we feel that we can now move ahead and uh, start our reforms. Our reforms are very straightforward. We believe that real development is human development. So we are going to, all our money, all the, each, uh, we've decided that all the money which we retrieve from the, the criminal mafia, we've started a massive accountability campaign. We will then direct it towards human development. We've started one of the biggest poverty alleviation program in Pakistan's history, despite having financial constraints. But we believe that a country cannot rise if there's a small uh, lot of rich people and a mass of uh, poor ones. This is what's happened in Pakistan. The gap between the rich and the poor has, gone, has grown with each year. And uh, uh, the whole system is just caters for a tiny elite. The education system caters for just a tiny elite. To, to give you an example, we have, we have uh, a total of students coming from 
what are the elite schools, English medium schools, are 800,000. The, the children who go to government schools, they are about 33 million. And then children who go to Dini Madrasas is 2.5 million. So we have three-tiered system. So the first thing our government is trying to do is to synthesize the syllabus, uh, bring in uh, science subjects, other subjects into Dini Madrasas, which are the uh, religious uh, schools. So bring them into the mainstream. Similarly, in the Urdu medium schools, teach them English so that we equip them for higher education. So we're trying to bring the, the education system, which is the biggest problem our country faces and the most difficult problem. So that's number one. Secondly is, uh, is the, the Pakistan taxation system. We have the lowest tax GDP ratio in the world. We have out of uh, a population of 210 million people, we have only uh, tax pay, barely people, uh, 1.5 million people pay taxes. So there's no way you, you can sustain a country if you do not ex uh, expand the tax base. So we are now are in the process, very difficult process, convincing everyone to come into the tax net. There are a lot of strikes going on right now, but we feel that we will be able to uh, overcome them. Uh, because it's imperative now that Pakistan um, uh, the Pakistani people pay taxes. Uh, the, the challenge, of course, has been that the, this mafia, I call this mafia, in 10 years, just so that you understand what they have done to our country. Because lo later on, people, you might ask me, why is this political victimization? What I call accountability, people say political victimization. But I'll just tell you what they've done to our country in 10 years. The total debt of Pakistan in 2008, before these two parties came in, when General Musharraf left, the total debt of Pakistan in 60 years was 6 trillion rupees. In the last 10 years, they've taken it to, from 6 trillion to 30 trillion rupees. So where has this money gone? I've set up a commission, a debt commission, which is now going to find out where this money is appeared. So which is why we are going, to, we, we are, uh, going through this uh, problem of finding out what happened to our country, how come we got so indebted. So the, the problem with having such a huge debt is that in the last year, the total tax revenue which we collected, half of it went to servicing debts. So you can't have 210 million people just surviving on um, this uh, already a very low tax base and then uh, half of it going into debt servicing. So uh, for that, we are expanding our tax base. But what we are doing now in Pakistan, it's the first time in 1960s any government is going to take this step. We are now moving towards a, uh, encouraging industrialization. In 1960s, Pakistan, Pakistan's industrial production was equal to four Asian tigers' industrial production, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, the combined industrial production was equal to Pakistan's in 1960s. Uh, after that, unfortunately, we deindustrialized. Our exports actually went down because our policies just did not uh, encourage industrialization. So we now have embarked on a prog uh, program of indus industrializing our, our country. We are giving incentives to industry. So we have, uh, the main programs in Pakistan are, number one, poverty alleviation. We have allocated the biggest amount to alleviate poverty. Any money retrieved from these big crooks will go straight into the poverty alleviation program. Secondly, industrialization. We are now encouraging our industry, uh, specifically export industry. We have uh, uh, trade agreements, one with China where, where we hope that uh, we will be able to, a uh, 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 free trade agreement with, uh, a preferential trade agreement with China. We, we hope to export uh, our stuff to China. China has imports of $2 trillion. So industrialization and third is agriculture. Pakistan is basically an agricultural country and we are hoping to get technology transfer from Europe, from China. Uh, hopefully uh, we've spoke to uh, companies in the United States so that we can improve our yields. Pakistan has the lowest yield, one of the 
one of the most productive lands, but the uh, lowest yield. So what we hope is that this three-pronged attack, we will be able to raise uh, uh, Pakistan's uh, economy, uh, provide employment to our people, uh, improve productivity. So this is basically where we are headed. Thank you.